first year as a hand at sea, Misa learned the names and positions of the constellations and the stories behind them. She was fascinated that you could find your way across the world by using the stars. She could mend sailcloth, tie the right knot for the right job, and fight, and talk her way out of a fight if her anger did not get the better of her first. Right now, like most afternoons, her job was to help the cook prepare the evening meal. Femi was a real thin man with dark skin and a stoic face. He did not joke or gossip, speaking only when necessary, and only looked you in the eyes if he was angry at you. He wore long robes and wrapped his head in light-colored cloths. He never left the ship, so Misa usually foraged and shopped for him when the ship was in port. Her farmer's senses allowed her to bring back the best ingredients, so Femi did seem to have a slight affinity toward her. He taught her to swim and fish. She practiced holding her breath underwater, but never could outlast Femi. There was a bit of chill in the air, and Misa was glad for the warmth of the galley and kitchen. The scent of curry, peas, potatoes, and fish floated on the eddies of steam. Everything was normal, except Femi. He sat in a corner of the galley, slumped against a wall, and staring into the distance through red, glassy eyes. His hair puffed out in a halo of black. The usual wrappings lay on the floor. On the table in front of him was an almost empty bottle of rum. He did not look at her, but said aloud that it was his anniversary. Misa remembered a phrase the captain sometimes said when Misa first came aboard and kept asking questions about people's pasts. A yarn swirls at the bottom of every rum bottle. They'll talk when they're ready. Misa sat down beside Femi as he started his tale. I grew up in a merchant family in a land of mostly desert. When I came of age, I set out to make my own fortunes. Out on my own, I did not become rich, but I managed to be extremely comfortable and did not worry about the future. I was ambitious and materialistic, not greedy. But I began to have dreams about increasing my profits, purchasing goods firsthand at bargain rates instead of paying procurers and importers. I envied my brother his wealth and finally asked him how I could match him. My brother invited me to accompany him on his next seafaring trip. My first trip was hell. I was frozen by the winds, fried by the sun, sickened by the relentless motion under my feet, and dismayed by the lack of variety and spice in the food. The dreams ceased, leaving me bewildered as to why I was so enthusiastic about taking the trip in the first place. I had been prosperous enough traveling roads and rivers. I swore that after my return trip, I would not venture on open waters again. My brother just chuckled and said that the sea was not for everyone, but he was glad for my company. I do admit that the trip was fruitful, that one excursion would double my normal profits, but it was not worth the misery and boredom that resumed on the return trip. And then there was a storm. The clouds gathered swiftly and the waves rose without warning. It was as if the entire sea suddenly wanted passage on our ship and leapt upon it, battering and shaking the vessel as if to break it to gain entry. For the first time, my brother looked worried. The crew rushed about with purpose, tending to the sails, ropes, and chains as the first mate bade us go below and stay out of the way. As we made our way to the passage leading below deck, a large black bird crashed into my brother's face and flustered him. In horror, I watched as he stumbled and fell over the railing and was swallowed by the churning sea. I called out to the nearest crew member who shouted, Man overboard! Starboard! He grabbed a large cork ring as nearby crew repeated the cry and passed it on. He tossed the ring in the direction I pointed but neither of us saw any sign of my brother. The place my brother went down was already about a hundred feet behind us and receding. The ship lurched and shuddered underneath us as the first mate again ordered me below decks. I ignored her 
and strength to keep my eyes on that one tiny dot behind us when my brother went down. The captain took a moment to give his condolences, as we could not fully stop in the storm. He promised to try to stay in the area so we could do a proper search when the sea calmed. For a moment, I was glad of the rain and spray as I could hide my tears. Then suddenly, I realized the cork ring was no longer receding. It was moving toward us. It took me a few moments to realize that I was not delusional. The captain had turned away to see to the ship, and I snatched at his coat and pulled him back with a strength I did not know I had. He cursed me, but I shoved him in front of me and pointed. I felt him straighten with realization as he called to drop anchor. With those words, the storm immediately began to clear, and the speed of the ring's approach increased as the waves got smaller. I saw the still form of my brother atop the life preserver, and a large bluish fin breaching the water behind it. As his body reached the ship, I climbed down the ladder to gather him from the ring. I gasped as a magnificent woman with blue-gray skin and a blue fin running from the top of her head down her back lifted her torso out of the water. I reached out, and she lifted his body into my arms. He was still as I passed him up the ladder to another crewmate. I was stunned, but managed to thank the woman. I had so many questions, so I offered her one of two magical stones I had purchased. To speak to you, I said slowly, hoping she would understand me. She smiled and slipped the stone from my hand with her webbed fingers. I heard my brother call out asking if I were alive, and I looked up to shout that I was unharmed. When I looked back, she had gone. No one else had seen her closely. She could not speak to me often through the stone due to her family's plans for her, but each time we did, we grew closer. And the dreams returned. This time, I was obsessed with finding a way to alter her so that she could live and walk on land and be with me. I began to study transformation magics, and I am not proud to say I did not exclude darker knowledge. I heard whispers about a shadowy figure who lived in the harshest desert and could grant almost any wish for a price. I sought her out and found her in a cave several days' travel from my home. I could not see her body in the darkness, but I saw her claws when they accepted the gold I offered for her help. And then she provided two egg-sized crystals, one blue as the sea, and one the color of the sand of the deserts I called home. Give her the sandstone and keep the sea stone. Repeat these words at the same time. Sand above sea, sea above sand. I wish to dwell in my love's land. Then touch the stones together. She will be able to live on the earth, and you will be able to live in the water. If that is what you wish. I left that cave shaken and excited and immediately booked passage on what I intended to be my last seafaring trip. I told no one, as neither my brother nor my family fully believed my story. As I set sail, I communicated to my love that I had a surprise for her. We met the night she found the ship. I climbed down the ladder and slipped into the water. I asked her to marry me and to memorize the poem as a vow. When she was ready, I gave her the sandstone. We kissed and then repeated the charm together. That was our first and last kiss. As screaming, she disappeared from my arms before we could touch the crystals together. I heard the cries of, Man overboard! Port! echo out through the stillness. Through the sending stones, 
we communicated what happened to each of us. She was wrenched away to a watery prison in a desert guarded by a giant sea serpent. And although I can now breathe underwater, when I step foot on land, my lungs fill with brine and I begin to drown. She curses me every night. My selfishness and arrogance led us to this fate. Misa poured out the last of the rum into two cups. She recognized their kinship and told Femi of her own quest. She promised that if she ever had the strength, power, and fortune, she would help to free both Femi and his bride. She also promised to bring him magical books and items if he told her where to look on shore. But I don't know where she is, Femi said. Misa responded, The next time you talk to your wife, ask her what the stars look like.